All right, welcome back to chapter eight, user interface design. This, we use this every day, right? It's a GUI, graphical user interface. This is, in modern times, how a user interacts with a computer system. Before we had GUIs, before Windows, before Macintosh OSs, you would type. Think of early DOS terminals. You would have to type words to interact with the computer. If you wanted to go to a certain file in a directory, you would have to type that directory out and it would take you directly to that and then use a list command and it would list all the files in there. You can argue that Apple came, Apple introduced the first GUI, the graphical user interface. Um, you can even split hairs and say that uh, Xerox introduced it a little earlier with the Alto, uh, but more people acknowledge that Apple brought it to market on a mass scale. GUIs allow us to have a more productive human-computer interaction. This is a term that in, describes how people interact with systems. Having it in a graphical interface makes it easier. They say that when we transition from text-based programs like DOS to graphical user interfaces, that the computer was more accessible to everyone. Think about, you can't even use a smartphone without a GUI anymore. It just makes sense. It's very easy. You don't have to be a quote unquote tech person to understand it. Having a very successful human computer interaction makes your program better. Think of different programs or even websites or apps that you've used that were just clunky. That they work. They were incredibly powerful on their own, but the layout of them was the detriment to the program. Maybe buttons weren't arranged in a very logical fashion. Things were counterintuitive. You can have the best, strongest, most efficient program in the world, but if the interface is not great, users are gonna struggle using it. So how do we make a really good interface? Well, there's seven habits of successful interface design. First off, you need to understand the business. Know what the application is for this program. Know your user base. If they are extremely technical, maybe we don't have to hold their hand through it. If they're not technical, if this is the first time they're using this program, or even the first time they're really using a computer, which you still run into those people, uh, we need to hold their hand more in the interface. We need to make sure we maximize the graphical effectiveness. What, what does that mean? It's like we talked about a slide ago. Well-designed interfaces enables rapid learning. I shouldn't have to have a user guide that goes along with a program. Think of Word, for example. Word kind of makes sense, right? If you wanted to bold a word, well, you click on the little bold icon. If you want an underline, there's a picture of a letter U with an underline on it. Word is a very mature, polished program. You really don't need to train people to use Word, basically, correct? Uh, there are more advanced features that you need to poke around with a little bit or be taught. But for the most part, you can sit somebody down and they can write a document and do basic editing of the document without much training. Something that's difficult for more seasoned programmers is to think like a user. You need to be able, once you're done making this, or at least you have a prototype or a very early alpha release, you need to look at this like it's your very first time using it before. And that's difficult, right? We all experience this when we are rereading our papers or really just looking over anything that we've done. Maybe you have a hobby. It's very difficult to critique yourself because you know what goes into it. Um, if you if you have this ability, you're an incredibly valuable programmer. You're an incredibly valuable member of the team. If you really can't put yourself into that mind of the user, it does benefit you to reach outside of the box, go to somebody who hasn't been as involved with this project and say, hey, I just need some fresh eyes on this. Can you come take a look? Use models and prototypes. What can we do to kind of test out, storyboard this system? A lot of times when we would develop systems in-house, we would actually sit down, put pen to paper and say, this is what I want the screen to look like. We would physically draw it out. This is what I want the screen to look like. This is the functions I want to happen. And we would storyboard out from there. And then we would sit down with the user and say, all right, look at this flow. How, how does this work? What do you think? Give us your feedback. And the nice thing about that is it allows potential users to also put pen to paper and draw what they think or rearrange the icons. You know, sometimes we get really fancy and we we'll use a whiteboard so we can erase and maybe move post-its around for basic features. And of course, focus on usability. This, this needs to be your number one choice. Again, 
If it's a clunky program, it doesn't matter how good or powerful the back end is. If people just can't use it, if it's awkward, the program's going to suffer. Finally, we need to invite feedback. We need to have this readily accessible at all stages of development, from early alpha releases to the mainstream release that's going out to the users. Somewhere it needs to be readily accessible is a button to send feedback. Whether that generates an email or prints out a form, it doesn't matter. Users need to be able to know that you are open to feedback, and they need to know that it can easily do it by a few clicks of a button. It really helps that every feedback report you get the user gets some sort of response. We don't need to give them an answer right away. Just acknowledge, hey, got your feedback. Appreciate you taking your time to help make this program better. It can be a canned phrase. That's fine. But we want the user to know that their feedback is valuable. And finally, and I can't stress this enough, document everything. Uh, I'll tell you a little side story. We had a program that we've been using for years. It was built in-house. Unfortunately, developer passed away she had no documentation on this and it was in C sharp which is a language that a lot of people aren't familiar with um, one we didn't have anybody fluent enough in C sharp and two we had no idea how anything related to each other because there was no documentation on this and this is tough for some people to document things because like you don't want to document yourself out of a job right if you're the only guy who knows how to use this program well you have job security but really, you're just hurting the organization because you might be sick, you might be on vacation, you might leave, and then the organization doesn't know how to fix, repair, or maintain this program. Document every step in any way. It doesn't matter if it's a Word document, actual pen on paper, scribbled printouts. Just make sure you document your progress. And I'm not talking about just building the program. Anytime you maintain, do updates, fixes. Two years after implementation, you have a thought, jot it down, put it in a file, make sure it's accessible to other people. You don't have to be working on a government project or something for the military or even banking information to know that security is incredibly important. There are a lot of things that we consider business sensitive or company confidential. These are documents, these are procedures that if they fell into a competitor's hand, could help, could prevent us you know, from losing our competitive advantage. We wanna make sure we keep things in house. Uh, there's a number of different ways we can do this. We can disable software, disable uh, USBs on the computers that our employees are using so they can't put in a thumb drive. Uh, a lot of companies are purchasing computers that don't have USB drives at all. They don't have CD-ROMs. They don't have any way to transfer data off. Um, sometimes we even limit printing of certain items. What we're seeing a lot more, this is actually kind of full circle if you look at the history of the computer, we're starting to go to uh, workstations or dumb terminals where the computer that the user is working really doesn't have anything on it, right? It needs to be connected to a network, similar to old mainframes where you just had a terminal that was a keyboard and a monitor and you interface with the mainframe somewhere else. We're seeing a lot of that today, mostly with cloud com computing where they would have maybe a Chromium type device that accessed everything on a secure server somewhere else where that user only has a network interface. He can't print information out. They can't transfer information. Everything stays on the cloud. Uh, this can sound a little high into the right, a little oppressive, but depending on what company you're, you're working for and what information you're using, this is absolutely necessary. You know, if you work for a bank or any sort of financial institution, it can be incredibly detrimental to not only the customers, but your, um, but your investors as well. If somebody with malicious intent were to download information, people's social addresses, names, everything, we can totally, um, you know, own our customers if their information went into the wrong individual's hand. We also want to make sure we monitor certain inputs, and this is really for two reasons. One, continuity. Just like I make sure that everything you turn in as far as papers has a certain um, format for the file name and for the top right corner where you put your name, class, date, stuff like that, just to make sure that you get into the habit of inputting things correctly, I want to know if certain users are inputting things into our database incorrect. That way we can find them and train them to make sure that these habits don't happen again. 
But I also want to make sure that nobody's putting any sort of malicious code, malicious program onto our system. Uh, a lot of companies invest a lot of time and money into logging activities of users. So much so, you know, what did they click on and when? Was anything plugged into the system? Did they go on a, you know, a personal email? Did they bring in their Gmail and maybe mail something off or put something on their Google Drive? And again, this could sound a little oppressive, but we want to make sure that the data integrity, especially with our customers' data, is held to the absolute highest regard. Uh, we can't have any security breaches. We can't have any data losses. This is, you know, detrimental to the company. It's detrimental to our customers. And it's something that some organizations have a very, very hard time overcoming. All right, that's going to wrap this up. If you have any questions, please let me know. Keep pushing forward.